Hi, it's Ken Ham, president of Anson Genesis Creation Museum, and the Ark Encounter that opens very soon. Uh, let me see, July 7. That's less than two weeks away uh, when the Ark Encounter will open to the public for the first time. Well, we're here in our design studio. I have a very special guest with me, uh, our Harvard trained scientist, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen. I'll just introduce him briefly to you. We're going to talk to him in a moment. And uh, Dr. Jensen, uh, first of all, what are your qualifications? You went to elementary school, right? Went to elementary school, <laughs> homeschool through eighth grade. <laughs> homeschool through eighth grade. You did high school. Did high school at a small Christian high school. Yeah. Then what? Then went to did my undergraduate in Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin Parkside, in molecular biology and bioinformatics. And uh, you have to say that a few times to wrap your tongue around it. But it's yeah, I was thinking of doing that, but I decided okay. not to. But anyway, okay. go on. Yeah. You have to think about it for a little while, and okay. then make a decision. So it's basically looking at life at the molecular level, chemical level, basically, and learning how to use computers to analyze all that data. Then you went to a very, very um, not well-known university. What was uh, its name? A backwoods Bible college known as Harvard. Oh, well, Harvard University. And what did you do there? Worked on adult stem cells, and PhD was in cell and developmental biology. So, so you had a PhD in cell mm -hmm. and developmental biology, and, and your undergraduate degree was in? Molecular biology and bioinformatics. And molecular, sort of bi molecular biology and bioinformatics. That's right. Yeah. And what, wait a minute, you're, you're a six-day literal creationist. A six-day literal creationist. And you got a PhD from Harvard. How did you right. do that? You kind of have to sneak through the door. No, you, uh, it's, you, it's the grace of God, and in my case... Real science. Real science. I didn't really try to hide my beliefs, but I also went into a program that wasn't explicitly origins focused. So. A lot of it depends on who your primary supervisor is, and so mine you, was okay with my beliefs. So, if you're going to study cell biology, mm -hmm. evolution has nothing to do with that, really. It's only if you're trying to understand its origins. If you're trying to understand, well, how does the cell divide, what controls chromosomes moving, what controls how DNA replicates, and other details, there's really nothing, evolution has nothing to do with that. So Bill Nye was wrong when, when he made the statement that if you're a creationist, you can't be a scientist, it would destroy science. That might be a little difficult to believe for some people, but yes, Bill Nye was wrong. <laughs> well, I tell you what, we're going to talk to Dr. Jensen as we walk around in here in the warehouse, give you an update about that. We're going to do all sorts of fun things as a scientist, and one of the questions I want to ask you is, how did they fit all those animals on the ark? But we'll do that when we go out and have a look at the ark here. I want you to be thinking about how many he fed on, because Bill Nye said, there's millions of species in the world, there's no way they can fit on the ark, and we've got an answer to that in the ark, and you're going to give us, as a PhD scientist, a little understanding of that. So we'll, we'll, we'll do that as we walk around here. Uh, one of the reasons I'm over here right now is, actually, for some of our donors, we had a program where they can obtain a piece of the ark, and I'm going to be signing these. I'm glad I have a very short name. There we go. So I've got to do this whole table full and probably more. I don't know. You've got to sign all these a little later. Uh, this this is actually, you might be interested in this. This is the flooring uh, of the ark. Actually, when people walk through on the ramps, uh, there's this flooring, then there's another layer that goes on top of here, a chipboard, and then there's bamboo flooring that goes on top of that. So the flooring is really substantial. And then this one here, this is what's on the outside of the ark. It's called shiplap. And uh, the shiplap comes from New Zealand. It's radiata pine from New Zealand, shipped in the Netherlands, undergoes a process they call a coir. And they, uh, it's a chemical process, basically, and they warranty it against warping or cracking for 50 years. And so uh, I don't have to worry about the outside of the ark. Uh, there'll be the next generation to have to worry about that 50 years down the track, I guess. But no, this is uh, the planking on the outside. I've got to sign these too. So where's my pen? Let me see here. I guess I'll sign these in the middle here. Uh, like this. Yep. Okay, so I'll be back to do those. But in the meantime, Dr. Jensen, would you join me? And we'll walk down here. We're in our uh, shipping warehouse, actually. This is not our bulk warehouse, our shipping warehouse. And as we walk down here, we'll just give people a little idea, too, at uh, what happens over here. Answers in Genesis has many different parts to it. You know, and you're part of the research department. Mm -hmm. So as well as shipping out all the materials, and then we have a graphic art designers, and we have the Creation Museum, and we have the Ark, and we have our sculptors and fabricators, and we have our writers, and our curriculum department for our uh, ANSWERS Bible curriculum, three-year curriculum used by thousands of churches, our BBS, uh, and the web department, our computer programmers. Uh, you're part of the research department. So here they receive the orders, and I see they're getting ready for, to, for today's orders. There are orders that come in from all over the world. 
and uh, they come down that conveyor belt there, they pick them from these shelves over here. As we walk down beside these shelves, we'll just give people a little look down there. And uh, have you got an answer for us yet, by the way, on, on fitting kinds of animals on the ark? I mean, no, it's a hard question. No, I'm just giving you time to think about it. And since creationists are dumb and have only 10 fingers, you know, it takes a while to count on them. E exactly. That's, that's what the secularists think, don't they? Well, uh, here we come down here, and I just want you to get a, get a look. Th these are the rows. Look at all this. Do you realize that? Nearly all the material in this warehouse, you see rows of it there. Let's go down to the next row. And uh, all of this material, just about all of it, is associated in some way with Answers in Genesis. Uh, we either produced it, authored it, co-authored it, or in some way we're a part of producing it. Uh, you see all this material. This is just our shipping warehouse. We also have a bulk warehouse uh, as well. And you know what, I, I tell you what, I get thrilled when I come in here and see all this, to, to know that all this material being shipped out every day around the world, it's like uh, arming the troops. That's Amen. what it is, arming the troops. Let's go in here, and we're going to go to the left around here. They're still working hard on the exhibits. I see all sorts of things down here on the floor, and uh, the exhibit installation, which is going ahead right now in the ark. People are going to be startled, they're going to be amazed. Uh, I am I, startled and amazed, but we'll come around here, because around here they're working on some of the dioramas and we're going to get to the arc one then I'm going to get you to, to answer this question. There's a bit of noise in here with our CNC machine so Mark will speak a little louder okay. uh, in here. So let's go over here to come around the back here. So this is a model of the arc as you can see here cut away through the middle. If we come around the side here and what they're doing they're going to have this set up to show uh, inside. They're going to be showing the cages, the pots and the pan, pots and uh, other storage bags and so on. Uh, cages. That they're, they're setting it up as if Noah had set this up to take the animals on board. Uh, they're getting all three levels set up. They haven't got it all finished yet, but it will be by the time it goes in sometime next week, ready for the July 7th opening, of course. But you can see what they're starting to do here. So as we look at this, as we, th this is done to scale, the same measurements that are used when we built the ark. Of course, the real ark that we built is 510 feet long, but this is done to scale uh, according to the same measurements we've used using the same cubit. So Dr. Jensen, okay, this is what the secularists say all the time. Bill and I said this when I debated him. He said it at other times. They scoff and mock and say there's no way Noah could fit all the animals that were needed on the ark. So how do you start to answer that? The, probably the first point of, the first interesting fact is the vast majority of species are basically insects or spiders, which are very small. There's a- And over, they, they probably weren't on the ark anyway. Probably weren't on the ark, but you think about that over 300,000 species are just beetles. Even if you took 300,000 species, it wouldn't take up much space. So you but, just dramatically reduce- the Bible reduced, doesn't say species. And it doesn't say species. So. The first point of emotional, oh wow, is, hey, we're not talking about a million giraffes, a million elephants, we're talking about the vast majority of that, that big number is really small things that probably weren't on the ark anyways. So, what are we talking about? Primarily mammals, reptiles, amphibians, land-dependent, air-breathing creatures. And that's what the Bible says, two of each kind of land-dwelling, air-breathing animal, yes. And of the, so, largely vertebrates probably, birds, reptiles, amphibians, mammals. And then probably not the species. The Bible doesn't use the term species. It uses the Hebrew word mean, which is probably best approximated by the classification level, not of species or even of genus, but family. So all cats, large and small, belong to the same family, even though there's 37 living species of cats alive today. Okay, so when God says two of each kind, seven of some, the word kind comes from the Hebrew word. How do you pronounce that word again? Mean, M-I-N. M-I-N, mean. What does mean mean? What does mean mean? Yeah, what does mean mean? And some translations is translated sort or kind, but following class order family genus species is man's arbitrary classification system. So yeah. you're saying kind relates mainly to family level? Probably approximately to family level. So for dogs you don't need two? And actually for the dog, coyote, wolf family, just two that, that have representative of that family. So if only had two, but we've got lots of different species of dogs today. Is that evolution? That would be diversification within the kind, which the Bible never forbids. 
what it does forbid is change from one kind into another. So from a cat into a dog, or a hippo into an elephant, or a giraffe into an elephant. Scripture says that can't happen. So in other words, dogs always remain dogs. So speciation is not evolution. Some people claim we believe in evolution because we believe in speciation. That's got nothing to do with molecules command evolution, correct? And what's really interesting from a scientific perspective, Darwin proposed an answer to a question that was fundamentally genetic. We recognize elephants because they pass on the traits for a long trunk, the big ears, generation, generation. Yet we really haven't had any genetic data to investigate species until now. So Darwin took a gigantic scientific risk, arguing vigorously for an idea about species a century and a half before he'd have any data to evaluate it. So we're, we're very different from evolution. One of the biggest differences is where that genetic, where those genetic differences come from. Darwin had no idea. Modern evolutionists have tried to put his ideas in genetic terms, but they don't work. And the research I'm doing is not only trying to rebut his ideas, but replace them with something better. So in short, it looks like God equipped those kinds from the beginning with a lot of genetic diversity. And it's just a matter of mixing and matching them. And to use Darwin's analogy, this is what breeders really do when they're creating all these different types. In fact, we have more breeds than species in those families that we've done the most breeding. Like, like dogs. Horses. Like dogs, horses. like horses. Horses, there's over... So we've got more breeds and species, mm -hmm. and yet they try to say different species is evolution, but yeah. not different breeds. Yeah. And in fact, this was Darwin's point in his first two chapters, that there's more variety in breeds than species. Therefore, if breeds have a common ancestor, why not species? Of course, he runs into trouble once you get to higher levels of classification because there's these gaps that show up. But not only that, breeds happen quickly. Yes. Which means, if he's saying, we've got all these breeds, therefore we can get these species, there's fewer species than breeds, the breeds happen quickly. Yeah. Doesn't that mean by implication, species could happen quickly? Yes. Even the evolutionists would put the origin of breeds on their time scale within the last 12,000 years. So if breeds take 12,000 years, surely species can't take millions. And that's, a, that's with an evolutionist time scale. With an evolutionist we believe it was time much scale. less than that, yeah. obviously. And if you have a lot of genetic potential from the start, you can get, as Gregor Mendel showed us, visible change in a single generation. Well, what about, no, okay, okay horses. Uh -huh. Wouldn't it take millions of years to get horses to get stripes, to be zebras? From the research I've done, there's probably a good chance that information for stripes was there in the beginning. That perhaps that ancestor that Noah took on board the ark was partially striped, and so you can get fully striped and no stripe from the same creature. How long would that take? One generation? Or? One generation. Today you can cross a zebra, as we have in our, in our, our petting zoo at the Creation Museum. A, a zebra and a horse, or a zebra and a donkey, the offspring are striped, partially striped. So is it a gene that turns on and off, or what is it? It seems to be some sort of complex genetic process. That's the, another discovery of modern genetics, of which Darwin was completely ignorant. Just how many different genetic loci are, are at play. For example, today among the horse species, there are over 20 million genetic differences. And all it might take is just one genetic difference to see something visibly different. So there's massive potential. There was massive see, so potential. So there's millions change. and millions of differences mm -hmm. in the horse kind, in the dog kind, uh -huh. in the cat. So no wonder you can get lots of species yeah. within a kind. Yeah. And it can happen quickly. In Gregor Mendel's experiment, he was just working with plants and was it whether a pea plant had green seeds, yellow seeds. One generation, you can see a change. Now, we're going to have exhibits in the ark that explain that. Yes. And explain Noah didn't have to take millions of species. Yes. He only had to take kinds, far fewer kinds than people realize. Yes. And at the most, overestimating, knowing that we can't watch fossils breed and just overestimating. At maximum overestimating. How many kinds would he have taken on the ark? Just a few thousand. That's an upper limit. Less than 10,000 if you really want to be generous with all your numbers. Conservatively speaking though, what do you think probably is more likely the number? The number of kinds is probably less than 2,000 and if you do the number of individuals and you're generous whether it was 2 or 7 or 14 or 4 probably less than 7,000 total individuals. Again, the number of kinds. But it could be less than that. It could be less than that. And there's still plenty of room on the ark? Plenty of room on board the ark. No problem fitting them all in. Uh, especially when you consider the fact that he's likely taken the juveniles, I mean, young adults, the young adults, that could easily fulfill the purpose for which they were brought on board the ark, namely to 
produce seed. Unfortunately, right. the New King James translates that species, which leads to some of this confusion. Right, but to be fruitful and multiply. Yes, they wouldn't take senior citizens. That's right. <laughs> so more like a young adult. This is just one of the exhibits. Mm -hmm. the, well, actually, this is just part of one of an exhibit. This is just mm -hmm. a fraction of one exhibit that's going in the ark. They're working on that uh, today. They'll have that ready for installation just to show how Noah could fit all the cages and how he could feed them. The detail, the level of detail is extraordinary. Um, well, uh, Dr. Jensen, let's go out this way and what we'll do is we'll go and have a look at something else happening here. Okay, because uh, we have some other remarkable things going on. I see they're getting the pagan temple ready for the pre-flood society and over the back there. Uh, let's come over here. Maybe, maybe our videographer could even uh, get a close-up over there, zoom in a little bit. Let's see how we go. They're getting ready to ship that one down to the ark and installate in the pre-flood society. It has a wonderful mural I see there that's already painted there. And uh, then there's another diorama over here. They're getting ready. In fact, we'll have a look at some of the sculpted people in here. And uh, we'll go in here and look at that. Lots of wood around here. This is a CNC machine, and let me see, the uh, Anzara Kitchen. This looks like this is gonna be the sign for the 1500 seat restaurant. And we're calling it Anzara's Kitchen. And so they're getting that ready now to go down there for, for putting on the restaurant. It's a massive restaurant, 1500 seat. So we're actually seeing that getting made. Let's come in here. Okay. And as we come in here, yeah, it's a little quieter in here. Uh, so we have some of our artists working on all sorts of interesting things. And it uh, looks like the pig is getting a haircut, uh, ready for installing in the ark. This is just one of the many, many animals that are going down there. We see some more over here. Let's have a look. I, I want to show you uh, some of the extraordinary work that's going on over here. So let's come over here and uh, we'll ask one of our artists if he can show us. These are some of the sculpted uh, people. Uh, look at that. That are going in a couple of those dioramas. And look at the amount of detail in this and hand painting everything. And, and again, this is only one small, just one small exhibit. Uh, of, of the entire arc and look at the amount of detail going just into this. It's extraordinary. Hey, Dr. Jensen, I was just thinking too, think about how much intelligent design goes into producing a sculpture that's not living. <laughs> Doesn't that say how much more intelligent goes into uh, producing the living kinds? Well, I thought it evolved over millions of years. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you just sat there on the desk and the clay came together, right? That's right. It, it just makes you realize how, how ridiculous it is for those people who believe Everything came about by chance, random processes. Okay, let's go in through this other door here. Uh, so, as we go around here, we're going to give you the first look, the first look at the figures that are going to go in the ark. And we'll go over here, we see our seamstress. Seamstress Sandy is here. And who do we have here? This is Jeepers Way. Whose wife? Japheth's wife. Oh, Japheth's wife. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So she will be in the uh, prayer scene there at the beginning. So did you make all these uh, yeah, bracelets we, as we well? Yeah, the bracelets, handmade them. We had volunteers handmade. who helped with that. Okay. And, uh, and then uh, who do we have over here? We have Shem over here. That's Shem? Okay. So this is Japheth's wife, you said? Mm-hmm. All right. And uh, Shem. So we have a range of skin shade in Noah's family too, don't we? Some are darker, some are a little lighter, uh, just uh, showing different shades. And uh, this is Shem. This is a first look at Shem. I'm supposed to put my first look at Shem. There he is. Is this for the first deck where they're all praying? Well, yes. This is where they're all praying and there's an animatronic Noah there. Correct. So the whole eight of them are there on a stage on the first deck and they're all praying, getting ready for uh, the pre-flood world. Wow. Again, I'm always amazed at the amount of uh, detail. Uh, let's see what, uh, what they're doing over here now. Um, I, I won't ask you the name of these. Uh, we might ask the artist the name of these. I would say that's an animal. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Probably a mammal. 
So what are we doing here? Which one are we doing here? This is the rhinoceros, okay. Uh, so look at the detail in those. And uh, Doug, what are we doing over here? We are painting Cody Larynchus. Cody Larynchus. What is Cody Larynchus? He's a synapsid that's uh, sort of turtley looking. A turtley looking synapsid. But he's not related to turtles. So people are going to come face to face with some creatures they've never seen before. Oh, yeah. Because they're in the fossil record, but nobody's ever made models of them as far as we know. Is well, that correct? This is one that we've seen a couple models of, but there, um, there are some different ways to interpret it. I don't, I don't think, I, I don't know if I've seen a life-size model of it. Though. But this is a life-size model. Yeah. Have a look over here. You get a better, better look at him over here. That's amazing. You know, people are going to find this fascinating because not only will they see animals that they're familiar with, they're going to see a lot of animals that they're not as familiar with too. I think that is that is amazing. What do we have uh, over here? We have uh, horses. Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell that's the horse kind. What about beside there? That's Placerius. That's another synapsid. It kind of, if you didn't know, you might think that was a, um, a protoceratops. They're very similar in form. But it's, but it's another synapsid. Not related. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a shark and a dolphin look similar to each other in a way. And so the form is similar. But so it's a separate kind, yeah, what you're doing there. And so, and, and Dr. Jensen, so here we are, here's a horse kind. So even from uh, horses, they're, they're partially striped, I notice. And that's mm -hmm. what you were saying before, right? Could, could you explain that again? Since DNA comes in two copies, you can have information for different traits in different copies of the genome. And since parents pass on only one copy, you can get a whole diversity of combinations in the offspring, striped and unstriped. And as those become isolated over time, you can get a whole population that eventually we'd call a new species that has different characteristics from the other descendants. So for something like this, you could eventually get zebras. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't take that long necessarily. The single generation. Single generation, and that could happen. And you've studied the genetics to know that could happen. Mm -hmm. So really, once people understand genetics, as you do, and you've studied a lot and, and continue to study, and we have another geneticist on staff too, Dr. George Apertum. The more you study genetics, the more you understand these things, because they haven't really done that much in the past. And in regard to speciation, you're starting to help people understand, hey, we have answers to these skeptical questions that are claiming mm -hmm. it takes millions of years for all these species, that are claiming Noel couldn't fit all the animals on the ark. You have a great scientific basis and observational science to say, you know what? You can fit the animals on the ark, and speciation can happen quickly. And we're not drawing on controversial or strange, far-fetched ideas. The idea that we can do this in a single generation is really Mendel's science, which is the start of most genetic textbooks. So there's nothing controversial there. The ability for populations then to grow from these is, again, straight from the evolutionary textbooks. The major difference is, what did you have at the start? And that's where they were going to protest. But We've got arguments now that are scientifically robust, that not only underscore what we're doing, but present a strong challenge to their time scale. Because there is a direct biological connection between the origin of species and the age of the Earth. They base it on the fossil record. And you've got biology and geologic ages there. So if I've got a totally independent field that says, no, these originated recently, the genetics originated recently, and I'm using some of the similar assumptions, it, it, there's a way it, it totally flips the argument against them and puts us in the driver's seat and on the offensive instead of playing defense. Well, this is marvelous. And when you think about it, there's many more evolutionary scientists out there than there are creation scientists. And yet, with the limited number, the evidence is so powerful, people like you and others can take on the evolutionary establishment. And the undergraduate training I had is really helpful. And the, the movement that has been going on to put all the data freely available online means virtually anyone, if they're trained, can sit down at their desk, analyze the reams of public data that are out there, and try to reach some conclusions. And that's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I wanted people to understand, in Answers in Genesis, even though we have a ministry to go to churches and help uh, train uh, adults and children, we have a research department, and researchers like Dr. Nathaniel Jensen 
and Dr. Andrew Snelling and Dr. Georgia Purdom and we have Dr. Tommy Mitchell and Dr. Terry Mortensen and Dr. Dave Menton and Dr. Uh, Larry Vardaman, uh, I mean different areas but we have a considerable research department and we have a research journal, ANSWERS Research Journal. Now a lot of what you're talking about here, you've actually published papers on uh, our, our website in our mm -hmm. ANSWERS Research Journal. If they go to answersandgenesis.org or they can just do a search online for ANSWERS Research Journal, mm -hmm. uh, they can find your papers. What, what are some of the papers you've already published in the ANSWERS Research Journal? I've done a number on the origin of humans and I think there's a strong signature from three different lines of evidence both the total number of, human, number of differences in the human population, uh, the way those differences are structured, the relative proportions, and, and the way they're grouped all seem to confirm, going back to Eve, three female lineages at the time of the flood, the three wives of Noah's sons. This is, I'm looking at some DNA that's only maternally inherited. And then... And it takes you back to three distinct origins, so It looks speak. like three distinct, very clear nodes and then shortly thereafter, a whole bunch of diverse people groups as if the Tower of Babel happened shortly thereafter. Wow, and you've got that published on the website? Mm -hmm. And what about speciation? Just published a big paper in April looking at and, and finally trying to quantify how many differences were there at the start. Was this mutation, did God create differences in the beginning? Which is of course the conclusion I'm leaning towards. And working out step by step how would this lead to new species and how quickly? Well. You know, one of the criticisms that I hear all the time is, ah, oh, that's not real research because it's not published in secular approved peer uh, reviewed journals. What would your answer to that be? I'd give him several answers. One, I'd say, how come their evolutionary literature isn't published in ours? So they want, they want evolutionists to review our publications, but they don't come to us to review their publications. That's so they a good point. They can't have it both ways. Right. Secondly, it's freely available online and I would relish a rigorous review. In fact, I'm often, and I wish I could find more contacts and solicit evolutionists to give us a critical review. We're a public ministry, the last thing we want is egg in the face. I would love for someone to give it a critical evaluation before it goes to press, but uh, my experience is most people don't even want to bother reading it. So, Because it's creationist, can't be right. Mm -hmm. In other words, their religion <laughs> their belief stops them from even looking at it. And then the third answer would be just that, that there's a long history of them suppressing contrary ideas, often in a circular manner. And unfortunately this happens not just with the secular world, but even experiences I've had trying to get into Christian colleges. Would you even allow a presentation for an alternative view? And they give this excuse and then you rebut it and they go to this excuse and they rebut it and they come back around to the original excuse and round and round that circle of logic goes. And it really comes down to an unwillingness to consider anything as suppression really of contrary ideas. Not that there's necessarily a, a vast conspiracy, but you have people who go through the public school system, the vast majority of people, the vast majority of scientists, that's all they ever hear. And so finally once they're in their careers to be uh, sideswiped by something that undercuts everything they've ever heard, I think is really challenging and they just can't wrap their minds around it. And I have seen, and we've uh, observed this even in recent times, where if a paper is published and it even hints at mm -hmm. the possibility that evolution could be wrong or makes a little creation statement, I mean, it's almost like you, you think uh, you know, that something catastrophic happened in the world and they, they wanted to delete it and get rid of it and the bias against it is, is so phenomenal out there. Yeah, yeah. But the other point is, you know, some of our scientists like Dr. Andrew Snelling uh, Dr. Purdom, Dr. Mortensen have published in the secular world. It's just th they, they don't have any key words in there like creation or anything like that and they have published and so people wouldn't necessarily know that they were creationists because they're dealing with real observational science. But if they know you're a creationist, you're marked and by and large you're not going to get in those secular journals, correct? And I'd even give a fourth answer and say, well, we've published these things and if we go back 50 years or so to the evolutionary community and their challenges to creationists, one of them was, God did it, how does that advance science? Give us a testable, falsifiable prediction, help us understand the world. Well, because genetics has advanced so quickly and so rapidly and all these data are available, from my perspective, the young earth genetics model has now become a testable, predictable way of understanding the world, way of advancing it. I'm fairly confident I can predict 
the mutation rate. I can predict the rate of change in this particular DNA compartment for the millions of species for which we have yet to measure it. So here's something scientific, testable, falsifiable that advances understanding the world, why things operate the way they do. My challenge to my evolutionary colleagues is you can dismiss the research all you want to. I've just met your historic standard. Can you live up to your own? That's a great challenge. And that's probably a good place to start to end off here unless we have any questions. Does anyone have any questions uh, that they put uh, here? Any comments they want answered? Uh, apparently we don't have any. I have a videographer shaking her head at me. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I, I, you've given us a lot of great information and at the same time we've got a little update on the ARC and yes, opening July 7, I think yesterday there were 400 contractors down there. Uh, we have a lot of people working real hard to get this uh, all ready uh, for the July 7th opening. So Dr. Nathaniel Jeanson, people can find you on our website, answersandgenesis.org. You've written articles on our general website. We go to our Answers Research Journal, mm -hmm. find some of your technical papers there, and I'm sure you'd be happy to receive any feedback mm -hmm. uh, through the Answers and Genesis website. They can go on there and give you some feedback, and you'd be happy to uh, answer them, and appreciate you being a part of our research team here at Answers and Genesis. And that will sign off from our design studios here in Hebron, Kentucky. We're about uh, 40 minutes from the Ark and about 10 minutes from the Creation Museum right here.